um, familiar faces and some new faces. Um, we're really, really happy that all of you were able to come in in these uh, fall, summerish mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, in a way, this, this program is very special for many different reasons. But I think in a way, it's particularly exciting for us because um, these last two, almost three years, we um, have been gravitated towards New Orleans. And it's a place that has brought us a lot of amazing ideas, incredible uh, colleagues and friends. And we have been um, conducting research with people from the region, but also bringing people from Africa and Latin America and other parts of the world to join us in New Orleans to think together. And I think if there is a place in this country where you can think together, uh, it's definitely New Orleans. And uh, we've been doing, um, we've done already two programs uh, of the curatorial program that were uh, curatorial intensive, which for those of you who don't know, it's a one week long uh, training program for emerging and literary curators that come together for <coughs> with a group of faculty that are in different level and like more problem of season and uh, with different levels of experience and coming from different parts of the world to uh, engage in a week long conversation and visit the city and discuss projects that these uh, curators bring to the table. We've done two of those programs in collaboration with Prospect New Orleans and uh, CCA New Orleans and uh, Lydia, who's going to be our uh, presenter tonight, was uh, part of one of the programs, the one that we did last year, and so was Larry, uh, who's also joining us this evening. So it's really great um, to, to have the two of them, them in the room. And part of the research that we've been doing and our interest in New Orleans has been to think uh, of the Gulf of Mexico in connection to the Caribbean and to Central America which has been one of the topics of research by CI. So we've done a series of um, travel um, residencies where we give money to a curator to go to Central America and the Caribbean to, to research in whatever topic that they have been investigating. We produce with Thurtan Cons, who's a curator that is currently based in New Orleans, an exhibition called En Mass. We're going to continue the uh, curatorial intensive programs with um, uh, the partnership with Prospect for 2017 and 2018. So uh, our love affair with New Orleans is an extended one and we're really, really grateful for all uh, that the city has um, offered us. And I think one of the best things that that city offers is the friendships and the colleagues. And uh, that's why I'm particularly excited to welcome Lydia tonight. Lydia Nichols is a curator and a writer from New Orleans who just recently went to the Caribbean to continue her research. She was in Cuba until a couple of weeks ago. And she has been doing um, a lot of research about uh, the experience uh, of Afri being African-American, the thinking about Africa and the diaspora, uh, the idea of thinking together and being able to communicate to a broader community, uh, both in her curatorial projects and also in her writing. And she has an incredibly amazing project in her pocket that she presented in the New Orleans Intensive that we really hope at some point she will make it happen. But tonight she was uh, very generous and kind to um, propose to have a conversation with Steve Kahneman, who is uh, an incredible uh, person working out of New York City and with a wealth of knowledge and experience that we're going to be able to uh, hear from and learn a little bit. So uh, thank you so much for that. And I'm going to let Lydia say a little bit more about Stephen. And then we're going to jump into listening to her conversation first. And then at the end, we'll leave room for you guys to jump in and ask questions and make this into a little bit more of an uh, open dialogue. So without further ado, please welcome Steve Kahn and Lydia Nichols. Thank you. Uh, thank you, MBC, for that lovely introduction, and ICI, the whole crew, for having us here. Um, 
I think she did a good job at introducing me, so I won't say anything more about myself. But Steve here, for those of you who don't know him, uh, he is a man of many stories and much experience. Um, as a curator, as a writer, probably more than anything. But he, he does a little bit of everything. Every time I talk to him, I hear a new story, of a new skill, a new experience that I did not know Steve had. A new friend. He, he has much to share. Um, so just to give a brief timeline that will help us through the conversation about Steve and his time in New York. He's from New Orleans, as am I. Um, moved to New York, I believe, in 1962. You got it. Uh, after a brief stint in London, and before that, he had been in the military. Um, and before that, he'd been in New Orleans, of course. Mm -hmm. um, he came here, he joined UMBRA, the Black Writers Collective, uh, that included Leroy Jones, who would later become a Mary Baraka, uh, Tom Dent, and Ishmael Reed, who he has a long-standing partnership with as um, and they, they share, they co-own a publishing company. Um, funny story, I found out recently when we were talking about said publishing company, they turned down Rita Dove's first book a couple of years before she won a Pulitzer. <laughs> So, it did me stand. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as I said, he's from New Orleans, as am I. He is my Wody, a word made popular by Drake and Beyonce. <laughs> but it comes from New Orleans. It really is Wardy, which means we're from the same ward, the 12th ward. We're pretty much neighbors, but we obviously, being that there is a, an age difference, experience different New Orleanses. Um, visually, uh, socially, etc. And so we'll be talking about some of that today, but also how how New Orleans, the, the top topography has impacted his writing and his relationships with people in New York, um, because he was kind of the New Orleans guy to seek out for a lot of New Orleans who moved here, who were in the arts world, and, and also the topography of New York and how that has um, impacted his writing and I'll read a couple samples later in the conversation of, of writing from New Orleans from this book in particular uh, his underground classic groove bang and drive jive around which warning it is a bit pornographic <laughs> <laughs> to say the least um, and uh, the, the New York sample excerpt is from uh, a review he did of David Hammond's um, retrospective in, what was that, 91? Yeah. Um, but we'll get to that later. At a PS1. Yeah, during PS1. Mm -hmm. um, so, where shall we start, Steve? So when you came, before you left New Orleans, what was New Orleans, what did it look like? I'm going to hold the mic for you as well. Um, describe the New Orleans that you left in the late Can you just sit the mic down? Okay. Well, before I uh, get into that, I want to uh, clarify one thing to you. And by the way, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate it. I, I feel great by being here. I don't think you guys left out, which John Chandler's in the audience. He knows that I'm sorry. I, I've been running an agricultural organization now on the side for the last 25 years, which is still in existence. And one of the board members, of course, is David Hammers, one of the you know, people that should be. Jack Hilton, Jane Greenberg, like that. But uh, what we do there is that uh, we were, we had a gallery we saw in uh, the shows about every other month, you know, getting good write ups from the New York Times and elsewhere, and time about the Wall Street. Can you use the right, please? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, because you moved it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, we also have a publishing company, uh, publishing magazine called Again in Charge. And which goes all over the world, and all the major museums and galleries, all the major galleries around the world carry Africa, China, uh, Russia, Latin America, the Caribbean. And uh, we also publish books of poetry by young upcoming uh, writers. But what I've done now, I've turned the uh, magazine into an online magazine as of now. And uh, what I'm continuing to do is uh, publishing the books of poetry. I've got six books in publishing. 
and I'm giving an anthology of 50 poets and 50 artists, uh, the poets and children of the artists, and hopefully we'll get some time in that somewhere. But to go back to uh, Lydia, so I just want to fill you in on that, so you know what I'm doing now. I've been blind since 1989, so I really don't do anything who does all, all the work as the interns. <laughs> <laughs> As it should be. As it should be. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, to answer Lydia's question, uh, my y'all is completely different from uh, Lydia's because I was born in 1935. I left New Orleans, got the hell out of town in 1952. And as Lydia can tell you, most people from our hometown either go to Chicago, they go to Texas, they go to Colorado, or they take their butt out to California. You see, where I'm finding very few young Indians coming, coming up uh, in this, in this di direction. Uh, yeah, the, the image, that, because I'm very, my memoir, I forgot to mention that, uh, and I was thinking about uh, uh, Lydia inviting me uh, to this event. My earliest memory, being an old boy, my mother died when I was two months old, so I was very confused by my father's uh, mother, my grandmother. I remember waking up one morning and looking at the walls, and she had all these drawings and paintings on the wall. And what it was, it was the dogs sitting at tables like human beings, yapping, yapping, and talking, and having conversations. And that was my introduction to art. <laughs> 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 the neighborhood I grew up, uh, grew up in uh, is, is called uh, the Garden District. And uh, where the house was located, it was on Golden Street, uh, 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 near Louisiana Avenue, and, and the other big street up there would be Napoleon Avenue. And on one side was say, uh, South Claiborne, and the other side was St. Charles Avenue. And, uh, and all I remember is uh, running around, and, uh, and in the summertime, is that to get so damn hot in the Orleans, is that uh, us kids, about four or five, six years old, we would play under the house and just get cool, or else we're going to uh, play on the tree because the, house, the hot sun is so hot, you get heat stroke, you know, you're out there in the hot, hot sun. But the good thing about the summers in the Orleans is that in the summertime, about three or four in the afternoon, it'll rain and cool the place down, and then of course, oops, here comes mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> so we did that, and uh, and of course, we were going to make punch and train. I didn't talk to my sister yesterday, last night. And uh, back in those days, it was doing segregation. So we had our own, uh, own park, like right near, uh, near the, uh, the punch and train. It was called uh, Lincoln Park. And that's where the, uh, the black folks would go. But we used to go uh, the punch and train as kids. And we would go, go prayer in, in, in the lake. I remember that. And um, what else can I tell you about it? Well, you know, my period down here was uh, in, in uh, everything was segregated. We knew the schools and uh, uh, the apartment places and things, places like that. And so there's only certain places you can go, and then for some certain places you couldn't go. But uh, the, the positive thing is, I think, which some people talk about, down on some people don't talk about, the uh, most beautiful thing about living in a segregated community is that you learn more than you wish to know about your culture. Clearly, <laughs> 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 you got it. Okay. Um, <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off if you were not done. Um, so, um, so given all that you learned about about your culture there, clearly a lot of New Orleans colors. Um, Groove, bang, and drive around at least, if, if not your later writings. Um, how, when you published that, you had already moved to New York. Why was it important to you, or why did you choose to write a novel set in in the city that you no longer lived in, that you had chosen to leave? Well, that's an easy, easy answer because uh, the way writers work. Is that uh, the further, uh, further, uh, further away <coughs> from the experience, the better perspective you have of, it, of the experience. I mean, if I was close to the experience, it would be disordered. So I decided to write uh, something about 
you know, ideology, I wrote in 1960, other ideology in 1952, this story takes place about 1949, 1950, so I had about a, uh, you know, 15, 10 to 12 year perspective on infants. Mm -hmm. So it's easy. Gotcha. I feel like now is a good time to read that excerpt I talked about earlier. Um, if you are religious or <laughs> well, I, I, or sane, well, <laughs> or sane. Let, let, let me put the whole thing in, first, uh, in context. Of I don't know if context. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's not going to help. <laughs> no, you okay, guys are going to get a big kick out of it. It's scurrilous. You guys, you, you guys are going to get a big kick out of it. I was hanging out with David Denson, Ishmael Reed, Clarence Major, Lilith Rapier Hall. We was all running around downtown, like Lily was sitting up in Humber and arguing with each other about Lily and blah, blah, blah. Clarence got published by uh, uh, the same guy who published the Henry Miller opening in Paris. And, and Clarence would come and bug, bug me all the time about writing, blah, blah, blah. So he ran him one day and said, Man, he says, uh, I told he's going to publish my novel. I said, well, damn, I said, yeah, I, 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 Clarence didn't even tell, him, I, I tell him about me. So the next time he came out, I said, Clarence, I said, one day I'll be telling him about me. He said, I didn't know you wanted to publish something. He said, here's his number. So I called the guy up, Jordius. I said, I'm Steve Cannon. I said, I'm just going to write something. So Jordius said, he said, look what, what you do. He said, you give me a first chapter and uh, outline, and if I like it, you go for it. So I thought about what to write in about three months, as Lily said, while well, I mean, I'm sitting in New York. In New York. Then I, th I thought about my teenage years down in New Orleans. I say, I got it. I'm going to write about this chick I know. <laughs> and what a chick she is. <laughs> 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 uh, when I first read Steve's book, I had just met him. Uh, <laughs> Willie Birch, who we've mentioned earlier, uh, told me to go to this address and tell tell whoever opened the door that he sent me. <laughs> so I went, and um, then I began doing my research. So that first chapter, I was at his family reunion at the beginning of the year, and his sister told me she couldn't get through the first page, his only sister who had tried to read the book. <laughs> so just to give you all a taste of, of what the book sounds like, I'll read that first page she couldn't, couldn't get through. It was already late, half past the cat's ass and getting later, 10 back of 12, and still Annette with her little young 14-year-old self wasn't home. But she didn't care. She stepped up to the jukebox, dropped two bits in the slot, and, and pressed J10. The bright hues on the electronic juke changed colors as the record spun and a pulse selected her number. She sensed the eyes of every male in the gumbo house, x-raying her well-stacked ass through her green miniskirt and black panties, down her soft brown thighs and round hairless legs and sandaled feet. The babe was dynamite and knew it. Dip, her partner, grunted approvingly of her shape and form, but mused about the contents as he rubbed her behind. A thrill shot through Annette's asshole to her cunt, up her spine to her head, exploding constellations inside her skull. It returned by the same route, tickling the lips of her pussy and rolling her hands. The pulse passed through Dip's fingers to his head, lighting his eyes with cherries, then down to his swipe, which bulged in his bells behind the action. I think that's about it. Uh, she called me and told me she uh, tried to read 
And when she started reading, she couldn't sit down. It was too hot. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about what about Annette, the young fourteen-year-old woman featured in this novel, was similar to New Orleans and, or, or yeah. Oh, you want to know about Annette? I, I do want to know about Annette. Could Annette oh, have existed uh, in, in the East Village of 1960? Yeah, because I should have really, asked John. That's not very much. All I can is that was happening right down the neighborhood. She's not on the table. She's not on the And the only thing I did is to change the, the, the scene, but the action I'm talking about really happened in New York City. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, all the erotic stuff I did the other day. No, what had happened is that. And when I was in the audience, we used to go back in the St. Bernard Project, meet some other guys, and pick up chicks back there, and said they'd pick up chicks in our neighborhood. And Annette was living uh, next door, and she was a girl in the house. We used to go and hang out at a called Pauline. And uh, because Pauline they had to kind of a party, no, no, blah, no, blah, no, blah, no, blah. No. And then he sang out with, with us there. And uh, her sister, you know, with, uh, uh, and that was younger, you know, I was uh, our age, he was about 17, 18 years old. And then that always wanted to hang out with us, and because, you know, they tell him, you, you, you're too young, go and hang out with young, uh, young girl. And I was in the book on the Street. And then it, uh, I called him one day, she said, guess what, Stevie? I'm moving up with my aunt up in, um, in Joe Taylor Street. Uh, let's hang out. So I took her to the Gumbo house, and that's when she went with, like, uh, Ellis uh, was on his, and my brother and people like that, and she started hanging out with us. And unfortunately, what happened, that girl was 14 years old, her family was Kathy, Creole Kathy, and she got knocked up when she was 14 years old, they threw out the house. <laughs> That's your book. Well, I don't see what she was like down there. <laughs> I gotta take offense to that statement. Those people down there, Steve? Uh, uh, Th those people down there, I'm one of them. You talking about? You talking to some guy who can go to some parts of New York and go to visit New Orleans? <laughs> he doesn't stay in New Orleans for more than like two days at a time. <laughs> <laughs> so when you came to New York, you were hanging out with the Uber crowd. How did you get into the visual arts scene? How did you get mixed up with those folks? Oh God, I knew those guys too because when I uh, when I first I. Uh, I came, to, I came to New York, I came from London. I was living up in Harlem, uh, near, uh, not on, on the edge of Harlem, I was living on the Hunter Street Broadway with two students from Columbia University. Those guys uh, had been kicked out of the South because they had been involved in the Civil Rights Movement down there. And uh, they were you know, sit-ins and, uh, and in drug stores and things like that. And uh, uh, so much people told him they have to get uh, arrested. Uh, they would uh, take a scholarship to any uh, university you wanted to go to. So they decided they wanted to go to NYU. One guy was an artist who so came to New York to study art at NYU. The other guy was in business. So I stayed with him on 10th Street for a minute. And then uh, me and uh, the artist got a place down on Clinton Street. And, uh, and through him, I, I met some other artists. And then I started hanging out over at the Cedar Bar, and that's when I met the whole scene, you know. So I got the whole art scene from the, from the Cedar Bar. Then they moved up to Maxis, Kansas City. Then the art scene moved down to Soho, and we were hanging out at Spring Street Bar in Finelli's, and then we sent Jessica and across to the area you know, at, at the Boy Club. So that's how I got to know all the and did hanging out with the visual art crowd um, impact your writing at all? Because I'm I'm super interested in the in the intersection of literature and and visual art, yeah. and, and how those communities interact and how it shapes what. Yeah, what yeah. Because what, what happens? I mean, if you're a writer, <laughs> and you're sorry to talk about uh, about your work, uh, about your techniques how they go about making the art, what you do and you listen carefully to what they're talking about because you can pick up and use some of certain techniques in terms of putting together a narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, just like if you listen to jazz, you listen to, uh, you know, someone take a solo like John Coltrane or Arnett Coleman, and you listen to your solo, and then you figure out how you can take what he's doing in the solo and turn it into a narrative. Mm -hmm. So you learn from each other. 
So, uh, did you have a question? Yeah, I think it's interesting that Steve mentions jazz at this point because it was a kind of trinity happening in New York. And especially when I went to university, I went to NYU in the 1960s, it was a triumph of jazz, painting, and literature. And uh, there was a, uh, in the bars and clubs in New York, there was a synergy, a kind of a communication between people who practiced those various, those three disciplines. And there were others, so there was dance going on. But for me, dance and theater, they were all in the mix. I mean, we're talking about a time in the 60s, especially when New York was the art, I mean, indisputable art capital of the world. The energy that was happening in New York at that time was, was like a renaissance, absolutely. And it affected all of, of the arts. I just wanted to interject. Yeah, because you know, it, it continued into, uh, when I got to town, keep in mind, I didn't get here until 1962. Mm -hmm. And of course, the pipe spot, you know, it had been on St. Mark's and, and, and Third Avenue. Right. And then when Arnett first came to town, it was on Fifth Street and Third Avenue. And then, he, then he moved back up to, up to uh, there. And then, of course, a slugs that opened up years later on, on Third Street. And, the Lower East Side. Yeah, in 67, 67 and 70. And then, you know, you have all, all kinds of dances down there. And then we had poetry, and she works poetry project. And, you know, and uh, a couple of galleries, you know, I met Joe on the street, and at the Cedar Bar, you know, when I first came to town, and he, he and I were still friends, of course. And uh, so I did a bunch of dances. And, you know, would be filmmakers, aspiring filmmakers, people like that. So, you know, like you're saying, you know, we all mix and mingle together, and we talk about what, what we do in our ideas, and we learn from each other. Well, you mentioned those clubs also. You mentioned uh, Mickey Ruskin owned the slugs. Yeah, Max. He Max owned uh, the Ninth Circle. He yeah, owned, right. Uh, he's, that's Max is Kansas City. Max is Kansas City, yeah. the Lord Manhattan Ocean Club. Yeah. Uh, so, in a sense, those clubs also acted as a kind of nucleus, a, meet, a gathering place for artists of various disciplines. I mean, when I was starving, had no money, you know, I had a I could go to Max's, I could sign the check, I'd have a, I could have a wonderful dinner <laughs> and sign the check and, uh, and sustain me for, for, a number, for a number of years, actually. Yeah, I remember um, uh, Ninth Circle, because that, that, that was Mingus at headquarters. Exactly. And then Mingus moved over, 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 over to uh, East Side, then he started to plan that, uh, you know, the slugs would open up. But as far as, uh, Mickey's concern, you know, I remember that. Then he opened up another club over there on uh, Avenue B called Annex. Yeah. Then that was downtown Ocean Club. By that time, we yeah. were in so the publishing company. So we said parties down at uh, that place here down there. Yeah. And he had ones on uh, St. Um, Eighth Avenue. That's where I met Joseph Brodsky and, uh, and what's her name? Uh, uh, Susan, Susan, Susan uh, Sante. Yeah. Hanging out. And then Max is kind of silly. Me and Ishmael used to go there every afternoon. He's had fried chicken there and, 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 and drink. And then uh, the, uh, he, uh, in the evening, uh, after dinner, we go and sit in the back. And that's where I see Egg Party all the time. In fact, that's where I met Andy Wall, because he used to come here all the time, because he used to go to my publisher, we go across the street. And Andy Wall would be sitting at the round table in the back. You know, over the courts. Right. We had a studio across the street from that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve, wouldn't you say that there was a separation of races in some way? Huh? I said during that period, as much as you commingled socially, the art world was segregated down here. Uh, I mean, uh, on the downtown scene? Yes, sir. Yeah, in, uh, in, in, in a sense, all I remember is that. Now keep in mind, I was living on, uh, the first place I got was on 4th Street between B and C. And all I remember, we had a movie house on Avenue B called the Theory. I can't remember the name of it. I think it was called Avenue B Movie House. The bar where we hung out at, the musicians, the painters, the writers, and stuff like that, was Stanley's. It was up on 10th Street and Avenue B. 
And as far as I was concerned, the only art that I remember being shown was in the lobby of that movie house. So we didn't have any galleries involved. Sometimes St. Mark's is supposed to work, and sometimes the library is supposed to work. You know. But as far as... So it's mostly studios in terms of art, right? I mean, because huh? I, I had an apartment on East 2nd Street, and uh, Klaus Oldenburg had a storefront on East 2nd Street. Oh, I remember that. So it was mostly, like, studios yeah, at studios. that time. Right, it wasn't a gallery. Yeah, yeah. right, and then, and then, the, then, the, then the bar opened up, and then there was, uh, you know, uh, 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 artists were sending those, uh, those uh, like, that space on the bar, uh, you know, illegally, and then they had a couple of fires, and the fire department made for signs up to say artists and residents. Right. Steve, again, I must reiterate the point I'm trying to make. Yeah. During that particular period, mm -hmm. the black community of artists played a major role in developing what we call hip, cool, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but they were not given credit. How did that affect you and your product? when you would sit next to someone who was selling paintings for a huge sum of money and no one would look at yours because you were Because right. here's what happened, I was selling someone that served the other lady. Is one day I'm sitting in Thomas Square Park talking to a whole bunch of black artists. This was about roughly, I think, I'm trying to locate the time. It must have been roughly about 1965. Uh, I, I think Hooping was, uh, was the, uh, was the director of the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art at that time. So well, we're sitting there talking, and of course I'm an only writer, I'm, I'm talking to a whole bunch of writers. They all decided to say, hey, is it see, guess what we're doing? I said, what? Man, we're going up to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we're going to have to be with the board up there and tell them what we want. I said, no shit. <laughs> they said, yeah, they invited us up, because people have been raising hell and saying, hey, you ain't got enough black art in these damn museums here. The country, so they invited us up for the meeting. Mm -hmm. So they went to the meeting, and then after the meeting, they came back. Uh, I'm sitting in the park again, maybe a couple of days later. I said, How did the meeting went? But we told them all. I said, Why did y'all tell them? <laughs> and that's what they made the New York Times at that time, because somebody <laughs> took a, a switchblade and sliced one of the Rembrandts, and the rifles had a fit, so they put that in the New York Times. And uh, I said, Well, what did you guys tell them? They said, uh, they asked us, well, what do you people want <laughs> to the artists? This, they, they turned around and told uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, director and the board, who was at the meeting of the Metropolitan uh, 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 Museum of Art, we want our own space. That's for the virtual studio museum. Do you feel like that solved the problem? No, I got pissed off at him. I said, you dumb son of a gun. Why are you mad at me? I said, listen, you guys got to have enough self-esteem and self-confidence in your work. Your work is good enough to be shown at the goddamn Metropolitan. Well, I think a lot of the artists at that time, Steve, did organize. Huh? I, a lot of the artists, myself included, did organize shows of representative black artists. Well, I'll we show the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, we showed the Met, we showed at the Whitney. Yeah, I have a, but all I knew at that time, John, until 1965, the person who was a curator at the, at the, uh, at the, at the, I met at the time was Lowry. All right. You well, know, I put on one of the first shows at, uh, yeah. at NYU, at, uh, the, uh, uh, NYU uh, Student Center. Now, what was happening in terms of, uh, and Joe yeah. Jackson was going around setting off stink bombs in the gallery. Yeah. Time. Now, in terms of uh, <coughs> uh, sitting next to some artist who's making a million dollars at Max's Kansas City, and the other artist I'm sitting there is making two dollars for that, Max's Kansas City. All I remember about that time is that uh, black folks were raising so much hell in the city, burning down this, rising every goddamn week during the summer, threatening this one, threatening that one. I uh, call them a uh, bunch of MFs and, and things like that, is that intimidating all these damn people, is that doors started opening up. The publishing, the publishing world uh, ran down to the east side trying to get by this right. Because they started uh, demanding black studies in schools and the truth in their new books. So they decided to need some books written by black writers, blah, blah, blah. Then what happened is that the galleries, museums for the most part, 
some of the men and blacks, uh, you know, being shown, and then uh, various galleries uh, picked people up. And Peter Bradley came over to see me and said, guess what, Stevie? I said, what? He said, the Dibonel Foundation wants me to put together a show in Houston, Texas. I was in that show. Yeah. So I asked Peter, I said, well, what are you going to do? I said, uh, because Joe had done a show there, and Larry, uh, 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 what's Larry's last name, Ron? Uh, should I think of his last name? It comes to mind. He had done a show there. Uh, but he did a show, uh, when, uh, I hate to come to a minute. But anyway, he did a show, because I remember uh, going to his gallery with uh, Dan, Johnson, Dan Johnson, and he did a show, I show him like people being lynched. That was his show down in Houston, Texas. Mm -hmm. Then Joe did a different show. Joe at that time was making abstract art, and he did a show of abstract art. He took David Henderson with him down to the catalog. But you know what the impulse for that show was? Yeah. The impulse for that show was they wanted to, uh, Rice University had been segregated. There were no black students at that university. Right. So they thought if they got a bunch of uh, black artists to show there, it would open up the uh, academic community to having black students at that university. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, we, that we went down there to, uh, to desegregate the university. Yeah, okay. And, uh, what, what's Larry's last name? That Jewish guy? Larry Rivers. Yeah, he went down there first. Because I know Clem Greenberg uh, asked Larry Rivers when he first met it. And he, said, he told Clem Greenberg, my name is uh, Larry Rivers. And Clem Greenberg said, what is, what is your real name? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he said, I need to use the Rivers, but what is your real name? <laughs> But he went down into the show first, then Joe went down, yeah. and then me and Peter went down, and I went down to Clint Greenberg, and we said at uh, the Demon Hill South back there, River Oaks, and it took us around the whole property home until that, uh, that, what do you call it, that, that chapel they had built from up Rocco and, uh, and, and uh, Rocco Chapel. Yeah, Rocco Chapel at Barnett uh, Newman, and she took us over to Rice, where he was dumping all that money in, and had those kids in the first year of uh, freshman English, we're going to be filmmakers. Yeah. You know, because they put money in all those places. But you're probably right, that was the intent. And then, of course, what I found out later, that the De Manils uh, built a pumpkin dome in, 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 in Paris mm -hmm. because they're a bunch of socialists, and uh, pumpkin dome was, uh, was a socialist. Mittering was a socialist. Yeah. That's when they built that. John De Manils' yeah. mm -hmm. collection of African sculptures is one of the finest in the world. Well, he just built a museum down there. Have you seen it? I, I, I no, because I got this friend of mine just got back from Texas last uh, week. It's a beautiful museum, but it had been uh, a sculpture, a collection they have. They also want to go to the museum of modern art. But you're right about what you're saying. Of course it's segregated, but what happened is that the way it got unsegregated, people intimidated those people and, 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 and insisted they, they, they gave them shows. Yeah, exactly. That, that was my point. They didn't have to publish it. They weren't going to do it on the Their writers didn't have to do that. They ran after us. Because mm -hmm. they wanted writers. Mm -hmm. You know. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as the artists are concerned, they, they had to uh, do all that. You know. mm -hmm. What do you think is the source of that difference between their, their pursuit of writers, their pursuit of black writers specifically, and their ignorance of black artists? Why, why, why were they not pursuing black artists, but they were pursuing black writers? What was the oh, difference? Because what had happened, it is crazy, crazy, crazy. It was so crazy, the 60s was nuts, you think of it. Is that what happened, and a uh, and, uh, writer, uh, uh, what's his name, who was in charge of the NAC field? Roger Wilkins. Yeah, Roger. Wilkins got all pissed off at. Uh, uh, the so-called black installations of that generation, meaning my generation at that time. Because they saw the young men academia across this country, we need black studies, we need black studies, we need black studies. And I thought it was stupid. The reason I thought it was stupid, yeah, I'm from New Orleans, I learned everything I needed to know about black people in New Orleans because the people who was teaching me in New Orleans was, uh, was uh, a subject of North and they were qualified to teach in college and universities 
but they had to teach in public schools in New Orleans because they weren't allowed to teach in college. And so we had some bright and goddamn teachers, and they taught us everything they wanted to know at that time about the Afro-Americans. Who the artists were, who the writers were, who the musicians were, who to celebrate, who not to celebrate, and all that kind of stuff. So I had all that on my belt. I read, I read Richard Wright as a kid. I read, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I knew all about Scott Joplin. I knew all that stuff about uh, well, Louis Armstrong, hell, he's from all that kind of music. And of course, I knew Paul Lawrence and Barry. In fact, my high school uh, teacher used to, at Booker T. Washington, used to recite a uh, book, uh, uh, Paul Lawrence and Dunbar, from memory to us uh, every day. We loved him in his class. He knew all that stuff. So by the time I got to New York, I met blacks up here who didn't have that history. And I was shocked because I learned it down there. Because the speed the South was always more ahead of North when it yeah. came to black history. Yeah, and I know the reason I mentioned it, and we saw harsh about the Senate because I thought it was absurd for them to demand uh, black studies in the schools when I had it already. And what what Roger wrote, the wrote and said they got pissed off at him, and when they started yelling about black studies, he laughed his uh, full head off, God bless his soul, since he's no longer with us. Uh, he said, y'all want black studies, y'all better get to learn some of these damn computers because that's where the world's going. And but, I think, it. but I think there was a prevailing sense in the Huh? in the culture at large, that there was no legitimate black art, be it right? Yes, there was. The only acceptable black art, really. No, there was. Really? I mean, even Richard Bright. I met Norman Lewis when I came in New York. The only city. acceptable black art was jazz. That's not true. I, I, met, I, I think there was I a met, prevailing I attitude amongst the larger community in America that that was the case. The only one well, that's sad. Yeah. Well, that's yes, sad. sad. I'm not saying it's not sad. What made it acceptable? Well, no, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Because I saw Richard Wright and Jess Himes and those people in anthologies. Yeah. In anthologies. That doesn't mean they didn't exist. I didn't uh -huh. say that. What, I'm, what I said was the prevailing attitude in the, in the culture at large was that the only legitimate art made by black people was jazz, was music. Now, that's sad. I mean, that's uh, I mean, look at Baldwin. I mean, I met Baldwin. I, know, I, know I met Baldwin in 1960. Well, I don't think I, I, don't, I was a freshman. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think I. I, I and, and and this is what Baldwin said to me. That's exactly what he said. Oh, I disagree. What? I disagree with what Baldwin said. I don't think that highly. I, I, okay. I don't think that. I don't think that highly Baldwin is a writer by the way. Oh. oh. I can understand. Why next time? I can understand. I can understand. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what happened with that. And in case you don't understand, there's a digression I was going to say about that right yeah, now. Norman Pavlovich sure. was the editor of the Commentary magazine at the time. Uh, he met uh, a ball we sang out over that uh, that bar over in, on, on, in uh, Thompson Street. I'm telling you, not the not the uh, Kevin Fish yellow one. Uh, but anyway. Norman Pollard and Baldwin were sitting in a bar, and uh, Baldwin was on the mountain and talking about what white folks should know about black folks and what white folks should do about black folks, blah, blah, blah. He's talking to a Jew. So Norman uh, Pollard said, Oh, well, look, he, he said, Jimmy, he says, I'm the editor of a uh, commentary. He said, We'll pay you to write an article uh, for, the commentary, uh, for commentary about that. So Baldwin said, I got an idea. And so, uh, 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 says, well, he says, I want to go out and give me, me plane fare. He said, I want to go out and talk to Elijah Muhammad. He said, okay, we pay for you for the plane fare. So he wrote the article. Well, in the process is that this is a, all documented in the non published memoirs. He said, oh, in the process, they were going to pay Baldwin, Baldwin uh, uh, $1,500, uh, $15,000 uh, uh, $15, for the essay. Then uh, no, uh, 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 New York found out about it. They offered Baldwin $75,000 for the same uh, essay. So uh, uh, Baldwin told him to give it to New York. That essay was written for white folks. It was not written for black people. But isn't it always written that way? No, no. Baldwin no. 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 didn't open a dialogue no. to white folks. He no, that's not true. He didn't? No, because they had been done before. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I'm not saying he was the first to do it, but I think he did open the dialogue in the 1960s. No, because other people were doing it. Roy was doing it downtown with Dutchman. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying he was exclusively the only one to do it. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying Baldwin did open this dialogue. And I think there was a need for that dialogue because there was, was going on and because on. there was a denial. No, it was going on. It was a denial. It was going on. It was huh? going on on all levels. It was going on in the music world. It was going on in the art world. It was going on in the dance yeah, world. I agree. With all that. I agree. All that. Absolutely. So Did that actually yes. didn't our Baldwin sexuality play a role in crippling his ability to appeal? Wait. I, I, I think the question is, we're going to have to wait for the the last 10 minutes, because I I, I want to see where the rest of the conversation between you yeah, and yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, I was enjoying this. <laughs> so, <laughs> if we... It's a matter of... And I mean, it's a matter of control. 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 Yeah, I agree. Um, so if we want to just skip to no, the you question see, answer, I, continue this conversation, I am fine with it. I'm hearing things from Steve. Yeah, I'm not going to hear this conversation. No. Yeah, it's it, not. It, I'm hearing things from Steve now that I haven't heard in 35 years. And it's good stuff. Yes. Instead of that, you know, yin yin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so can you repeat well, that question? Because what happened one day I was sitting with Joe, Sidney, and Curry. And, and by the way, you're talking to the guy who hopes Joe get that damn gold over there. I know. But anyway, be that as it may. And Bowen's sitting there. And I'm telling Bo when I saw the magazine, I wanted him to give, uh, give, uh, give, he wrote a, his version of uh, the Signified Monkey, his version. I said, man, give me that thing, I want to put it in the He said, okay, I'll give it to you. And meanwhile, so me and Joe, uh, Joe got in discussion with Bo with who invented abstract expressionism. Hmm. Well, as you guys know, Norman Lewis invented that. He was one of the uh, pioneers. Of, yeah, he invented it. Pioneers. He, he never been. got credit for it. The New York Times did. It's one of the, the, New Times did. One of the tragedies John, of, the, of John, art. John, the New York Times admitted that. Yeah. And you can dig it up. Oh, I know it already. Well, they said I've had no No, no I know but, they, but the New York Times gave you credit. Yeah. So when it, it's, been, it's been legitimatized. <laughs> the art world on pass never did. And it was a tragic. It was a tragedy in Norman Lewis's life. That's not true. Yes, it was. Come on. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. Norman Lewis you know, never received uh, no, no, his proper no, recognition no, 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 until no. after he died. Yeah. Huh? Until after he died. How, he never, how many shows did he do? Compared to Jackson Pollock. Compared to Jackson Pollock. Compared to Cooney. Compared to Motherwell. Compared, and he was there with all those people. He was right there with all those people. I know. He just became a and I asked you, Steve, why didn't you something with There are photographs, there are photographs, group photographs that the New York School of Painting, the original school of abstract expressionism, in which Norman Lewis is shown with the Cooney, with Motherwell, with uh, with uh, Pollock. Exactly. It's one of the tragedies of contemporary modern American art that Norman Lewis never got his just desserts. I'm sorry. Now why did the time I'm a painter, my man. But why did the time I study I studied, I studied yeah, art history. If you want me to write something about it, I'll do it. I'll publish it. I have my own pumpkin house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'm free. I'll write something about it. No, I'm serious. I'm, I'm serious too, man. Okay, um, I live that. I live that. Okay, well, let's do it. Your question? Can I ask a question? Steve, this is Armand, another Nova, another New Orleans guy up here. Go ahead. Uh, Steve, uh, the, uh, the music scene when you were living in New Orleans yeah. in the late 40s, early 50s, Yeah. Uh, could you comment on that? Because it wasn't just jazz that started in New Orleans, but you had, as I understand it, the black music scene in the 40s was referred to as race music, and then in the 50s you had Fats Domino and Professor Long Hair, and you had the rhythm and blues and everything, and then rock and roll came along and lived off. We have to it as race music. That was industry lingo. Yeah. Yeah. We read that. I don't, that. I don't know. I don't know any. Uh, and I, I okay, lived in Chicago. I just, I just want to. I don't think we have to refer to it. Can I just ask Steve to comment on that? You know, the only thing I remember, you know, growing up in, in that town at that, that period of time, because I, uh, 
Uh, you know, uh, Lydia is sitting right next to me. Uh, and she just got back from Cuba. And uh, she told me about Cuba and everybody else was in on Cuba. You walk through the streets of Atlanta, all you hear is music all over the goddamn place. And New York is the same kind of town. You walk through the streets of New York, you hear music all over the goddamn place. Meaning, I started playing drums when I was two years old. My, my brother played trumpet. When I went to grammar school, you know, I learned how to play all kinds of shit in terms of music. The, what, the, what they do down there with you in music, you learn white folks music and black folks music mm -hmm. all at the same time. Yeah. You know, you know, the, and there's sure. one or the other, you know, girl. I went to the opera when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Give an example, you know. But as far as what I was interested in, because, you know, I grew up, I came of age uh, 14, 15, 16 years old. Not like Annette, by the way. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> by the way, no, I came of age uh, 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. Hell, man, we was a bird. We was out to get some bebop. <laughs> I grew up with Alice Von Sellers and people like that. And some kick ass fucking drummers. In fact, Arnold Colbert's drummer, uh, I, 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 a black girl was from the Orleans. You know, that was his, his drummer. But I grew up with this guy, so I was just some bebop. And we called that stuff to his friend, uh, I lived here down in, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, the first quarter, uh, you know, first region all. We call that old folks music. We call that white folks music. We just, what, you know. how, what was that? The traditional jazz you referred to? Yeah. 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 That's the place you play down the in, 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 uh, It's kind of museum forward. music. Huh? It's kind of museum music. Yeah, well, that, yeah, yeah, but, so and we, we thought that was jive. I, mean, I, I knew some of the musicians, but I grew up around a whole bunch of musicians. So they used to go down and play down in French Quarter just to earn any money yeah. so they can come back to the neighborhood and play what the fuck they want yeah. to play. Yeah. You know, but they didn't, they didn't take that shit serious. You know. yeah. <laughs> that was from back in the days of John Little Martin, if you like that. Wow. I was telling yeah. somebody the other day, well, oh, yesterday, this one came to see me, this brother from the New York Times, me and, me and uh, Ellis used to come hang out at Pastor Dabrona's house. Frank Sinatra and Lydia, we sit there and listen to Frank Sinatra records. Frank Sinatra was listening to Frank Sinatra? He'd be sitting at home listening to Frank Sinatra records. He's got a good take. And meanwhile, you know, and, uh, out there in the party, if you see Rosemary, you can tell I'm coming back home. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we didn't think of it as racist again like that. I heard about that label, but I think that came out of Chicago. That's so. what he thought about. Yeah. <laughs> I got a question. Steve, in the black community, as you mentioned earlier, we got to learn culture because we were forced to learn about each other. We learned just different levels and types of blacks there. Uh -huh. I said that you mentioned earlier about how we being forced to live amongst each other as black people, we got to learn about our history. No, so, because what happened? Let me, let me raise my, yeah. my question, my, my point, please. Uh, my question is, you, who have accomplished something quite magnificently in your, with your limited job, the resources, et cetera. What is holding you back, or what has held you back in your need or ability to really make your point as a writer, uh, what, what is it, a, 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 a poet, et cetera, et cetera. I don't, the question sounds a bit convoluted, but you, I think you got to do No, that. because here's what I feel about my, my life. You're talking to a guy who's 82 years old. Now, and now, I've been in New York since 1962. What have I, what have I accomplished in New York City? What I've accomplished, I've showcased over a thousand artists. I've showcased over a thousand poets. I've published over 50 poets. I've been publishing that magazine for 50 years. I'm not going to tell you how many poets and writers I've published. And a lot of them, because the tribes are doing quite well with the lives. I agree. But what has there, ever been, has there ever been mm -hmm. a hindrance mm -hmm. to your progress? Yeah, my, my, my blindness. No, no, no. I knew you before you were blind. Huh? No, come on. Let's be real. Well, I'd like to do, if I could. Uh, I met Steve when I was a freshman at NYU. And uh, up until that point, uh, I had not. Uh, my comprehension of the contribution of African American artists was minimal. I certainly I knew about African American artists, I knew about Tanner, but 
a living African American artist. I didn't meet until my freshman year at NYU when I stumbled across Amiri Baraka, Steve Cannon, Ishmael Reed. Uh, David Henderson, Felix of the Sign of Forest, and, uh, and Verdame Grosvenor, uh, and a host of others who were all living on the Lower East Side. Archie Shep, uh, Arnett Coleman. And for me, it was the most extraordinary uh, happening. For me, it, it gave legitimacy to all of the art history that I had I come out of music and art high school, so I already had this kind of background in art and art history. Where did you grow up at? Though? I was born in Virginia. I grew oh, up okay, in, I grew that's up in New York. Because in Harlem, you, as soon as you walked out your house, there was art. I grew up in New York. Well, I'm saying it's, it's I went to the high school of music and art. Well, I went to Congress. I, 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 I had my first show when I was 15. Okay, no, I'm not quite, I'm just saying because, you yeah. know, what is So I, I knew about art. Okay. Well, what I'm saying to you is I met these. Steve Cannon and a group of other artists Good. who were the living embodiment of okay. art. That's my point. No, I understand your point. I'm just saying there was art all over the place, though. Kids used to dance well, I, for quarters on the street. You know, yeah. I mean, this was art. I met, I, met, I met the true magicians of art. You know, I met uh, John Coltrane. I met uh, Sun Rock. I met these, the embodiment of this genius. And for me, it was extraordinary. There's a big difference between that and people uh, dancing for pennies in, on, the, on the corners of New Orleans. Oh, so you never experienced the black church, because that's sort of that's oh my, 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 my grandfather. Okay, was a minister so, of the church. So, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's that okay. was our art. I'm that's sorry. The root of our art. I'm sorry. That is the root of our art. The black church. See, I was six years old. We couldn't sit still when I heard that music. That, that was my point. Well, you're going to give your butt down the other way. You really have some energy. Right? <laughs> really. Don't go to Cuba, really. You're going to take your booty all over the place and take your butt to Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Quickly and rapidly um, into digital publishing, and has that even affected your relationships? Right? Well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to put that, and I'm glad you asked that question because I'm going to put that in perspective for you. One of the positive things that happened in the '60s, all of us across the board, Native Americans, the Chinese American, uh, uh, Hispanic American. Irish, Jewish, all of us decided to major to tell the major public houses, excuse my English, to go fuck themselves. <laughs> now what we all did, we all found our own publishing companies to publish what we want, when we want, and how we want to do it. There's now nowadays there's over five thousand small presses from Florida to New England, from Chicago to the East Coast, and the same number on the West Coast. And we're all in touch with each other. And there's a big book fair happening in Brooklyn next week. Mm -hmm. uh, I would advise you to attend. You'd be surprised how many publishing companies there are now. Mm -hmm. And all, a lot of those people, we all started back in the uh, 60s. The first person who gave a lot of money to the arts was uh, the guy who got his head, who left his head down in Dallas, uh, John Kennedy. He decided that money should go into the arts. He got the idea from, uh, from French. Now, who passed that bill in, in Congress was Adam Clayton Powell. Mm -hmm. And what was found at that time was New York State Council of Yards and blah, 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 and on and on. But when I came to New York, the only people who gave money to Yards was the Rosenfeld Foundation. That was it. And then after that, the ball started rolling. And nowadays, in answer to your question, a lot of people are doing, doing the digital online, blah, blah, blah. But uh, I heard on the radio, you probably heard the same thing on this show, which is funded part by the city of New York, National uh, and, and, and WYC, on, on the media. People are reading more books in print than ever before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're alive and well, and we're doing quite well. And we have conferences and book fairs all over the country, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, that magazine I do, uh, Gathering Tribes, is used to 50% art 
and Trigger and Country Person Text. That magazine goes to every museum in China, in Africa, in, in uh, Taiwan, in Korea, in uh, Russia, all in every major museum in the, US, in the United States. The reason they carry it because they have art in there. As far as poetry is concerned, uh, the uh, Poetry Foundation in Chicago just got $100 million and they collect that magazine as well when the magazine of posters in Schaumburg and places like that, major universities. But that's not just true for me, that's all, all, all the small persons. So will you still be doing print copies for the things? Oh, everything is strictly online. So how will that change your relationships with museums? How, what's your like dissemination? No, the only thing I'm going to do now is you now I'm turning 50,000 years old. I'm going to do an I told you. And that anthology is going to go to the major museum in the world. If I'm Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what we do. That's going to be uh, 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 Steve Cannon's farewell, uh, farewell song to the art community. I made my contribution. It's time for your generation. <laughs> it's our <laughs> turn. Yeah, really. really. <laughs> so piggybacking that, that statement, what advice would you give to our generation to continue to work? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What advice would you give to Millennials have a generation to continue the work and then continue to build. Well, what I love about people like Lydia, and I probably love the same thing about you, but I know more about you, is that you guys got the energy and you got the, uh, got the passion, that's all it takes, and nothing's going to stop you. Mm -hmm. What I found out, I was telling someone that the other day, I don't care how gentrified the Lower Side gets, how gentrified the United States gets, or anything like that, artists always find money. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, we robbed banks. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they find a label on it. <laughs> hey, did you hear what she said? She said, yeah, we robbed banks. Right. <laughs> Can I just say, so yes. just make a comment. That's all about, about the passion. <laughs> yeah. Um, about the music in New Orleans and yeah. Steve here in opera and all the music and stuff like that. I think most musicians take from it. Various places. They do. And it fuses. They do. It fuses. And, and, they and do. Scott Joplin stat, learned about Wagner's operas from they a do. German professor in St. Louis. They do. That's where he got the they idea do. of writing operas. You, you talk, you talk to a guy right now who's a big time with authority on Flicko, Flicko now, me. Yeah. <laughs> I know about Chinese music too. You know what I'm talking about? I know the kick ass and contemporary uh, composers hey, in, in Korea. I suggested the last musician to jam with the Chinese guy in the summer that plays the guru. Yeah, you remember. Because he's so out of tune and it was yeah, you, you remember, Bush, you remember uh, Susan and Bush Morris had Chinese and black musicians performing together at Bob's What? Bush Morris. Bush Morris. Oh, yeah. yeah. You remember well, we had Bush, uh, Chinese and black called, musicians. What Chinese? Yeah. He did that for years. Mm -hmm. No, I, I agree. If you listen carefully to any, 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 any music, you think tribes is multicultural. Shit, music has always been multicultural. Yeah. <laughs> well, what did that look like? I say? too. Oh, what I did that look like? It don't mean a thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, in other words, you, me as a writer, yeah. are you guys as artists, mm -hmm. or whatever you, uh, your, your discipline is, dance or whatever you, you do, comics or whatever, you know, you don't learn from everybody. You know, when it comes to learning technique, you don't sit there and say, I'm just learning from black people. Hell no, you learn from everybody. Well, yeah, that's if you're right. white, you're just learning from white people. You learn from everybody. Anybody learn from everybody. That's people. right. You steal. And you try to, you try to improve your technique. Yeah, that's what it means when they say art is universal. Yes. yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But those wow. people, those people in the universe should benefit from originating. Huh? <laughs> What's that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, said those people of the universe should benefit from originating it. Oh, they do. Yeah. Now, if you want me to help you guys, I can help because I publish. <laughs> and I, you know what I feel? 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 Good about tribes. You know what I feel? Good about tribes. I can publish anything I want to and don't have to answer to it. So. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I don't have to That's say, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Fuck you, I do what I want to do. <laughs> are you the exception to the rule? No. That's why I always
was a small, small person's did what he did. Steve, I have this way. question. So you define this, this, this space now where publishing and artists have been liberated through the, through the digital age. No, is, no, is that happening or not? Are we, uh, no, we're talking about two different things. Let me listen carefully. A <laughs> young lady asked me, oh, what, how does the digital age in, uh, uh, impact on what, what us as publishers or artists are doing? Right. And what I said, if you listen to other media, people are reading more books than ever before. Than ever before. So, we're so they're right there right. in both. For example, you talk to one guy, I just saw that Kevin Tyler Powell was a friend of mine. He used to read his poetry on the New York Weekly Poetry Cafe. He was on the radio this morning because he just did a book on a two passion two, two pair, and I just ordered it. Ordered it, and I ordered it as an e book. But oh, the word is out in terms of uh, the uh, media right now is that uh, print uh, uh, books are outside e books. Mm -hmm. I wish you'd tell that to Spray. Hey, Steve, tell that to Spray when I take my books there to sell them. And they offer me $2. They offer me 15 for I'm surprised Spray has been able to hold on as long as they have. Well, what happened now, if you know Margot Jefferson, uh, she had a book party at the Strand two years ago. She did? Yeah. Yeah, she wrote a memoir about it. So. If we well, don't have, well, okay. let, me say, let me say one more thing. I left something oh, out. <laughs> what I left out is that uh, John was talking about the community of writers and painters and musicians uh, that he met on the glorious side. Mm -hmm. I met the same kind of people in our hometown. Mm -hmm. oh, cool. Who I hung out with is a little boy in our teenagers. I hung out with musicians, artists, and poets and dancers and blah, blah, blah. The only difference is all black. Up here was mixed. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. Mm -hmm. And don't forget the dope game board us together too as artists. But if you guys gonna sit down and defend Jay's ball, you talking to the real guy. <laughs> 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 I don't think ball needs my defense. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not with you. Yeah. Any more questions? No. Could I say one last thing that wasn't answered? Yeah. Steve, you mentioned ball, and I tried to raise the question. The question is, do you feel that Baldwin's sexuality inhibited his recognition as a great writer? No, it helped. Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you why. Because Tennessee Williams, Truman Capote, and New Yorker, and you know all that crowd, crowd is gay. And if you want to know about uh, uh, the, uh, the culture community in New York, New York City, you got more gay people in the culture than you in New York. So he was a good company. <laughs> and you know his first book, Giovanni's room. Ah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was great writing, but and when, I went, story. and when I went to St. John D. Bryan, and the place was packed, you know, uh, uh, Baldwin Ciro and Baraka, meaning Leroy Jones, I still call him Roy, God bless his soul, <laughs> and got up on the stage, and then he started uh, uh, singing the praises of Baldwin, <laughs> and he had one sentence, and he said, and Baldwin was our man. I said, what? <laughs> he might have been your man, but he did my man. <laughs> uh, yeah, Steve, uh, uh, re referring to uh, gentrification, uh, the gentrification of uh, the Lower East Side. Uh, the, the, whole, the, the whole guy in the The whole there. world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other thoughts you want to offer about that process? And how it's affected mm -hmm. art and creativity. It's horrible, huh? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. fucking horrible. Yeah. And the thing that pisses yeah. me yeah. off with these gentrifiers, they can yeah. care less about the artists. Right. Okay. It's just like a different degree of thing to think. Right. Right. Yeah. right. You know, on the Lord's side, you give an example. Right. We got 200 gallons that just opened up since the new museum opened up. So the jump is yeah. the gentrifier, I walk right past the outside. And and her and artists who have been driven out of uh, their neighborhoods by the increase in rents, uh, there God knows what's happened to them, right? I mean, all over. Uh, yeah, and I heard that um, that um, the Bush the Bush didn't become a gentrifier. It's horrible, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
And that was really But you know why that's what I'm in the They will find a way. He doesn't own this building. You don't know your building? The building that Travis is in? Is that your building? No. No? no. Oh, wow. Would you... Sorry. Talk about it, Steve. Yeah. Would you recommend that the creative class of people buy property so we can yes. keep price out yes. of our property? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of Because one, well. of, one of the biggest yeah. issues that I attended a yeah. uh, 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 forum that Steve was running mm -hmm. about Henry mm -hmm. Morocco, he was encouraging that every black... He showed a map. The USA with little red dots. Little. And those were the dots of property that people that blacks own. So like if you were to own enough property, you got voting rights. Yeah. And the whole fucking and staying rights. Everything else. And political. That's yeah. the that's the sole solution for the American business. You know one of the major problems we have. What are you guys talking about now? <laughs> <laughs> What about your building, Steve? Yeah, what oh, that's a long story. Yeah. Just uh, give us the short version. That would be my memoir. <laughs> <laughs> we have to wait for your memoir to be <laughs> So you you had owned the building, yeah. right? The one on third. Right. And what happened? Why do you not own it now? Oh, that's a long story. Really? Yes. But as far as where you guys are talking about in terms of uh, uh, people, uh, you know, on property, they share it. I think that artists should do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if they, you know, can't do it individually, they should come together. Yeah. Well, they do. Collectively. Mm -hmm. They do. Yeah. They do. Buy property. Steve, what happened to that building that Kwame owned? Is that still in existence? Which one? That Kwame. Remember when women used to come down and do benefits? Which building are you talking about? On yeah. 7th Street. And you go out under the name of the tribes. You remember when the sellers would come down every year and do a benefit? Oh, that building. Yeah. He is a beautiful thing. Y'all made me realize something that happened beautiful on the Morris side. That was sweet, yeah. We had this woman by the name of Margarita Lopez. She was a Senate Councilwoman uh, on the Morris side. Uh, she jumped ship. And she gave that job. She hand, hand, hand picked her, her, her uh, uh, successor, Rosa Mendez, right. who is now the city councilwoman from the other side. Uh, she is up for rejection today. Anyway, what happened when Rosa I mean, uh, Margaret Lopez was a uh, was, uh, city council, she cut a deal with all the squats in the neighborhood. At that time, we had about 12 squats you know, in that neighborhood. She uh, walked up to all the squats and said, Look, uh, all you people can buy your building uh, from the city of New York for a dollar. Wow. Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. You buy the building for a dollar, that means you're going to have to fix these uh, buildings up and get them up to standard, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that means you're going to get a, you have to get a mortgage. Yeah. 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 So they all got mortgages yeah. and they got some beautiful buildings on there. The only one that didn't do it was Red Whitt was there. Because Dominique was out of my goddamn mind. Okay, I know. You see me, your homie. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> so what's going on with that girl that went and, uh, went and played at around the corner, they finally got, they got some senses and bought it. Mm -hmm. So they bought it from the city. Uh -huh. You know. So all those squats. Uh, in fact, we have a squat museum down there, too. Now, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. what about, but they, they are only on buildings. Huh? What about Joe Street's? Uh, Building that was purchased privately, though, wasn't it? No, Joe made a deal with the city. It's a long oh. story, and I'll keep it short. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it>. <laughs> <laughs> me and John Ferris, uh, Joe was homeless. He was staying with me. He met Corrine through me because he used to come and hang with me. And every time I go somewhere, he comes to the street. That's how he met Corrine. <laughs> anyway, when he was staying with me, he was so frustrated. He was running around all the Lower East Side to try to find a building, and he found that building there. And me and John Ferris had to go to 500,000 community board meetings every week and tell big lies about what Joe was going to do that building. <laughs> now, the big lie we told was that he was going to turn that, that building into community center, 
and teach the young kids in the neighborhood art. Mm. That never happened. It happened. Well, it, it, it happened. happened indirectly. It happened. It happened for three sessions, and then Joe got married. Take it down later. No, but he uh, he was able to get it to direct it from the city. Yeah. But it has become, as you said, a museum and a, a rather significant uh, voice in the arts on the Lord's side. Well, it's beautiful because what's happening is that. Uh, and some of them, uh, David, David Hamlin Hamlin was talking to me last night, he said, you're so crazy, he wants to own the whole block now. <laughs> <laughs> no, what's was so, was so, was so beautiful is that all that stuff is being documented in terms of the arts and blah, 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 and his archives and blah, 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 and now Joe wants to build a museum of our Street to continue. Steve, I think you should give the name of the gallery. Can you tell about it? Yeah, because yes. you know what? I have never read a, a, a major review on that place that had some of the most incredible artists showing there. I'm sorry, I can hear you. I have never read a major review on Ken Calibre. I can understand why they can't get reviews. They, I've been on trials for 25 years, and Holland Carter would come down and review shows at trials all the time. Mm -hmm. I had no problem getting Holland Carter to come here. I think the reason, the reason no, don't tell you I said right. that, because he finally cussed him out. He probably cussed him out. that generation, 50s, 40s. Yeah, it was a hell of a gallery. Well, if there are no more questions, and it's approaching 8 o'clock, do you have, do you have last comments? Well, number one, I want to thank Lydia for inviting me to people who run this organization on what a wonderful job they're doing. And, uh, and, and I'm overjoyed and awed that you people decided to have your conferences down in my hometown of New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that I, I, I literally should be thanked because she sat here and she answered all your questions. <laughs>